This episode of Hello PhD is sponsored by Promega and listeners like you. Thanks for your support. That will help guide you towards something that is actually fulfilling to you rather than what society says is important. Welcome to Hello PhD, a podcast for scientists and the people who love them. This week, we open the mailbag to answer your questions about what to do when you want to leave your PhD program. Stay with us. Or don't. You can leave. It's fine. And we're back. This is Hello PhD, episode 170. I'm Joshua Hall. I'm Daniel Arneman. And we'll discuss the human side of science and life in the lab. Hey there, Dan. Josh, uh, I see you on a screen. I did see you in person this week, which is very exciting. You uh, toured the South again, came back to, for a visit, and we got to get out for a beer. Yeah, it was great to be back in North Carolina for a short time and hang out and uh, see you face to face. I'd like to point out, allow me to tell one story. You didn't bring sure. a coat. You thought that North Carolina <laughs> was so warm, you wouldn't need a coat. So I had to bring you a coat when we met up. Yeah, you know how when you leave some place and then you have selective memory where you only remember the best parts. And so, yeah, I just assumed it was 70 degrees all the time. Palm and it trees was not, everywhere. <laughs> it was not, but you were kind enough to uh, let me borrow a coat because yeah. we were still sitting outside uh, you know, observing uh, proper distancing. and It was probably in the 40s. Still cold. You know, I was thinking that if there's, if there's one thing that uh, the pandemic has done done to us, which is many things... Um, it has completely changed our perception of what is an appropriate temperature to sit outside. <laughs> That's true. Could you imagine uh, three years ago us going out on a February evening where it's 40 degrees out and like, let's sit outside. <laughs> There's not a chance that we would ever have done that. <laughs> yeah, the outdoor heater business must be booming right now. I'm looking forward to a moment when we can go back inside. I think there's a lot more, there are a lot more places we could visit. We've, we've kind of narrowed ourselves down to just a handful that do have outdoor heaters. But in any case, Josh, tell us what ethanol we are sampling today. All right, Dan. Well, we're going to sample an ethanol that uh, I actually shared with you when I was in North Carolina. And this one kind of came out of left field for me. It's not something I would normally gravitate to. But over the holidays, uh, my brother had this Crown Royal peach. And Dan, you're probably familiar with Crown Royal. Yeah, it comes in the little purple bag, right? That's right. It's a Canadian whiskey and very smooth, very approachable for a bourbon or whiskey. And But this one, this is a special edition a flavored whiskey uh, peach, Crown Royal peach. Now, I normally completely avoid out of hand any flavored whiskey or bourbon as being gross cloyingly sweet, artificial flavor. Um, but I thought, you know what? I'll try this. He has it. He's offered it to me. And I was surprised how much I enjoyed it. I thought, this is not that bad. It has everything going against it. Fake peach flavor is one of the worst fake flavors, typically. And so when you offered this to me, I thought, uh, I don't know how they do things in Maryland, but <laughs> down here in North Carolina, we don't <laughs> drink peach flavored Crown Royal. But it, it, it was surprisingly smooth. Uh, and it didn't have that kind of sharp fake peach flavor. It, I, I think you said this, Josh. It tasted a little bit like, uh, even though we just had it on ice, it tasted a little bit like somebody had mixed a cocktail. It did. And I think that has that is one thing I have enjoyed about this when I'm not in the mood for just a beer or a wine. But, you know, I'm not really one who is up for the, the work of putting a cocktail together at home on a, on a weeknight. But pour a little bit of this over some ice, and you really do feel like you're, you're sampling some craft cocktail. Very smooth, very drinkable. And according to the Crown Royal website, it is made with fresh Georgia peaches. So I don't know if that's the entirety of the flavor, but surprisingly good just over ice. Someday I would love to see ingredient labeling laws for alcohol because I don't believe... Well, maybe, maybe that's true. Maybe that's why it didn't have that gross fake peach flavor, because it actually contained peaches. Unsure, but I'm looking forward to when the weather warms up, if I can still get my hands on this, um, maybe my drink of the summer will be the Crown Royal Peach uh, Whiskey over some freshly brewed iced tea. I think that'd be a nice, refreshing summer beverage. I will look forward to it, Josh. Uh, tell us about our sponsor. 
All right, Dan, wanted to say thank you, as always, to our friends at Promega. Promega has a student resource center that offers a collection of resources on molecular biology techniques, as well as resources on wellness and career development during graduate school. You can find video libraries, blog articles, technical guides, really anything you need uh, to help you navigate graduate school. Everything on there is designed to help students succeed in research, career, and life. You can check it out at promega.com slash hello students. We'd also like to thank all of our patrons, and we have a new one this week. Special thank you to Shannon. We'll see you over in the Slack channel. Thanks, Shannon. And if you'd like to support the show, also you can go to patreon.com slash hellophd and get access to our patron-only Slack channel where we talk about science and Wordle. All right, Josh, the mailbag is about to explode with questions and inquiries, so let's get it open. All right, Dan, we've got some great emails today. Um, the first one came from Owen. So, gents, this is my second ever podcast feedback email to say thanks for your recent episode with Alexandra. I've been listening for a few years, and this was the episode that most stood out for me. I'm on a fairly odd journey to a PhD. I've had a pretty successful first career in a technical area, but now I'm pursuing research in business school. I'm doing it part-time while working in a fairly substantial day job and with a young child, so I could relate to pieces of Alexandra's story. I'm not sure there's a straight line for me from here to a PhD, but my backup plans have backup plans, and I think some path will help me get there eventually. Your show has been really useful along the way. Big chunks of it I don't understand or have context for. But there have been a dozen or more episodes I've listened to repeatedly and often taken time to read around topics you introduced me to. I hope you'll keep going for many more years, even Josh's, even with Josh's new location, Owen. Wow, you know, that's really great, Dan. And, you know, it surprises me sometimes. Um, we do have a lot of listeners who are outside of just the sort of science PhD world that, that we come from. And because that's our experience, a lot of our, our topics center around that. And a lot of our listeners are from those fields. So I'm, I'm really glad to hear from people like Owen who are finding something useful, um, even if they're outside of the, the sort of science PhD realm. Yeah, it's exactly what I hoped for when I talked with Alexandra. I, I knew that there were people struggling with some of the same things that she had been through. And just to have that positive story that things did turn out uh, as long as she, you keep working at it. So, oh, and best of luck to you. Uh, we'll be really curious to hear how your journey progresses. And uh, if you make it into a PhD program, or even if you don't, we'd love to hear from you and, and see how it turned out. Okay, Josh, next email comes from Ben. I completed my undergrad in a biological uh, field. I've redacted it to protect Ben's identity here. It wasn't until my junior or senior year that I started to think about research. I didn't have any internship experience in college, but I was working at a nonprofit for kids and adults with disabilities, and I developed this passion for addressing neurological diseases and disorders. I wanted to work in R&D at a biotherapeutics company, but I quickly realized that I would most likely need a PhD to get there. I was fortunate enough to find a lab at the university that sounded relevant and interesting. They had available funding and a friendly PI. I just started the PhD program in January, and I'm already having major doubts and concerns. Listening to your show has helped me realize that uncertainty and anxiety is very normal among graduate students, but I wanted to get your advice regarding my situation and PhD career pathways in general. I'm concerned that I jumped into this lab prematurely, and that I would enjoy an engineering position doing more day-to-day problem-solving work a lot more. I got some experience in two different labs prior to this one, but I didn't really enjoy the research aims or the day-to-day work in those. Maybe down the road, I would be much more motivated and passionate about this kind of investigation, but right now it just seems like the lab and research in general may not be a great fit for me. All that being said, do you think it makes sense to stay put in my lab position if I don't enjoy the lab work much and find it hard to stay motivated, just because I'm hopeful that an R&D type position will be a good fit for me long term? I'd love to hear what you all think. I have really appreciated all the encouragement and insight over the course of the show. So thanks a ton. That was from Ben. All right, Ben, thanks for this email. And I think this is a great topic to to discuss. You know, you get into a PhD program and then you immediately feel like, okay, I think I might have made a mistake. I don't know if this is for me. Yeah, and and he recognized that. I, I really appreciated that he is aware enough about imposter syndrome and some of those feelings that everybody faces. He said... Uh, listening to the show has helped me realize that uncertainty and anxiety are very normal among graduate students. So that's a, that's a good start to be able to step outside yourself and say, hey, maybe these things I'm feeling don't mean that I don't fit here. Yeah, absolutely. 
and there's a few things I want to I want to discuss though with regard to to Ben's question and email. You know, people are drawn to research for lots of different reasons, and I think particularly biomedical research, which we mentioned, Dan, is what what both you and I did. Uh, but I think with biomedical research specifically, there can be this additional motivation that some students have to make an impact on hu- human health. And and Ben even mentions having some experience working with uh, folks with neurological uh, diseases and disorders, which kind of led him to maybe pursue this path. Um, and that's great. So I think it's a common reason that a lot of people might choose a biomedical type PhD program. Maybe you know people who've been impacted by cancer, some other disease, or you want to be part of some solution to ease human suffering or find a cure. Research, though, can be really far removed from actually directly helping people in the present. And I wonder if that might be what Ben is feeling a little bit here. Um, You know, oftentimes as a graduate student, even if you're a PI who's running a lab, you're making these small incremental contributions that hopefully combined with everyone else's small incremental contributions around the world, eventually that'll move us closer to, to better treatments or easing human suffering. So, so to get some of the things Ben said that stood out to me, um, there were really two questions that, or sorry, there are two sentences that jumped out at me. And the first one was Ben saying, I was working at a nonprofit for kids and adults with disabilities. I developed this passion for addressing neurological disease and disorders. So I think that's really important. The fact Ben had this experience that he identified something in himself that connected with working with those folks. Um, However, the second sentence that jumped out to me was when he discussed working in the lab. And he said, two different labs prior to this one, I didn't really enjoy the research or the day-to-day work in those. So I guess what that leads me to think is that maybe maybe research is really not the way, um, the best way for you to intersect with these passions that you have. You know, sometimes people try out research in the first lab they get into is not a good fit. So maybe they aren't interested in that specific question or the environment's not a good fit. But here, you know, Ben's had experience in three different labs and kind of has similar feelings. It's just not, it's just not doing it for him. Um, now what I would sometimes say Um, And I might actually say this in the next email we're going to talk about in just a minute is that PhD training definitely can be hard and frustrating for most people at times. But sometimes if the career you want, you need that PhD to do, sometimes the payoff is worth the effort of going through the PhD. The juice is worth the squeeze, as they say (laughs) sometimes. Um, But my concern here is, you know, Ben mentions possibly wanting to do R&D at a company. But a possible problem with that that could arise is a big part of R&D is the R part. (laughs) It's the research part. And it sounds like Ben might not actually like doing research, which is totally fine, by the way. Yeah, I'm totally in agreement, Josh. Saying, I don't like this research, and I haven't liked my previous research experiences, but I want to go do a career in research. That was a track I was on, <laughs> and, and, and so I have firsthand <laughs> experience with that, and that would have been a nightmare for me. Um, he, said, he said he started the program in January, so, so he may have been in the, in the program for a month now, which is very early. So he, it's not as if he has, has spent a lot of time, so, so that's one of the considerations. Um, but what I would, I would want you to do, Ben, is to take the time before you leave, before you uh, quit and, and go into something you don't know what it is, take some time while you're in the program still to do two things. One, start to figure out what careers you actually think would uh, make you happy. So I recommend going back to episode 144, my interview with Marlis Hansen about motivated abilities and going through that process to figure out what kind of work would really make your life sing. So, So look for those things, but also... There are opportunities, especially this early in your training, to craft your experience to be more, more in line with who you are. So maybe you don't like sitting at the bench and pipetting liquids all day. There are ways to develop a project so that you're interacting with patients. Uh, I, I think that's, it's possible to find collaborations between labs or researchers. Maybe you can uh, make components of it that are better suited to what you want to be doing. And so before you leave and start over, think about how you can take the experience you have now. And if you can't make it what you want it to be, you have a very clear vision of what kind of career you want and you don't need this PhD, 
then at that point you haven't spent much time and it's it's okay to leave and to pursue that other career yeah i couldn't agree more dan you know ben followed this path because he it was working with people that that led him down this path and it sounds like maybe he's not getting that as much in these research opportunities so i agree with you dan Ben, if you can find a way to get that thing that you need that is in line with what you want within your PhD program, then by all means it might work out. But if you realize you can't um, and realize there are actually other careers out there that you don't need this PhD for, then then maybe that's a good good fit. But I agree with you, Dan. It's probably best to research all that in the context of while you're still in your PhD program than just uh, jumping without a parachute. Yeah. If, if you find out, though, that you can't change your your research topic or modify it so that it's actually in line with what you like to do, then the next five plus years are going to be really rough. And so this is a great time to be having these considerations rather than doing it in uh, some of the later years. Josh, do you know off the top of your head what uh, programs or departments or the types of people that Ben could talk to to find out about more uh, clinical experience or research interactions? Like, does he need to go talk to researchers at a hospital or where does he look for that type of experience? So, yeah, Ben, I would say, you know, if you, if your institution is part of a medical center or is close to a a medical center, many biomedical research programs are actually um, within a university where there's also a medical center. um, Then there probably are faculty who are doing research that's called, it's called translational research that really is directly linked to patients linked to work that's going on in the clinic. So you might seek out and talk to some of those folks. Um, maybe there are people who are doing neurodevelopmental or neuro, neuro neurological disease research that's very translational. And you know if there's a way you can get involved in that type of research where you see that direct connection with with the disease and with the patients, you know, that might do it for you. Um, I'd also just recommend that you talk to, if there's a career office or some career folks, um, ideally like within sort of the biomedical training umbrella at your school, talk to them. But even just at the school at large, talk to them, share with them. They might have some resources for you to explore what you want to do. And besides that, I think just looking around, thinking about different careers, imagining yourself doing different things, listening to that episode that Dan um, that Dan mentioned. Because I think a big part of this at the stage where you are is self-reflection and just better understanding yourself and what motivates you in a career. And then you can assess if where you are now fits that. And maybe if it doesn't, is there a way within the context of that training you can do something that more fits you? Great. Um, but if not, it might be a great opportunity for you to realize now that you need to make a change. Like you said, Dan, better now than five years from now, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I I just want to throw in one more idea that I think came up in Ben's email and that's the question of impact. Um, You know, we, we talk a lot about motivated abilities and we talk a lot about uh, what kind of work style you have and how you like to be managed. But when you come home at the end of the day or when you step outside of your day to day task and you reflect on, what impact your life is having, what impact your work is having. A lot of us want to have this huge uh, impact on the world. We want to change the world. And I think that's a a beautiful and noble desire. Um, I think the trouble is we think that to get there, we have to do medical research that leads to a drug that helps 100 million people. And that's not true. I think working with those uh, adults and kids with disabilities is making a huge impact in those people's lives. And, and it's not worse or better than you know, doing drug discovery. And so um, I think when you stop to reflect on what kind of impact you want your career to have, that will help guide you toward something that is actually fulfilling to you rather than what society says is important. You know, doctors are important and medical research is important, but actually, you know, a teacher is important. And, and somebody who uh, is serving others, even in an individual basis, is also important. And so don't lose sight of that. All right, Dan, I think this is a good lead in to our, our next email. Okay, the next one comes from a listener. We'll just call B for now. Uh, B writes, I'm a fourth year international candidate in cancer biology in the U.S. and so glad to have found your podcast amidst my most challenging moment in graduate school. 
Uh, here is my story. And, and she summarizes her, her life bas- all the way back to the beginning, basically having been born prematurely. She talks about her early life and, and some of her pretty extraordinary academic achievements, even after that difficult start. Um, she started first grade early. She went to university at 16. She got full scholarships in the U.S. after two years of studying in her home country. Um, she finished her last semester of college in three months, and then 12 hours later, after graduating, she was back on a plane to start graduate school in the U.S. So, um, you know, just the story of, of, a, of a prodigy, somebody who, and we've talked to people like this, Josh, uh, just at every stage of their academic training, they have excelled. Uh, but she goes on, the past two pandemic years made me reassess whether I was living urgently for the right path or simply living the path that was logical for that prodigy preemie. She says she's found something she's passionate about. Speaking openly on social media about science was one of the simplest but most rewarding and purposeful experiences of my career to date. In my fourth year as a PhD candidate, I decided that following my mission in science did not necessarily mean putting my name on a publication, having a stellar H index, or countless citations. Living for those metrics, an unavoidable cause for those who wish to thrive in academia, did not translate my passion for science or my capacity and desire to impact people's lives. Rather, my decision to transition from academia and master out of graduate school comes from the perception of how often we concentrated in our own scientific bubble or topic and very far from each other and those who we produce science for. It is not easy to come to this decision, and I've been trying to not be overwhelmed by what others may think is a failure and trying to focus on everything this difficult learning time of the past four years have taught me and what could be the best future direction outside of academia. However, it is really tough to envision anything, or even start a job research. What kind of positions to look for with my job skills? If it's not so much to ask, and because your words have comforted me many times down this process, I would like to have your scientific advice on which of other types of careers scientists could work in outside of academia. Thanks for reading this. Keep up the good work. Your podcast has been worth a thousand sessions of therapy. And that was from B. We should charge more, Josh. Thousand sessions of therapy. That'd uh, that'd be a lot. Yeah, I pay for therapy. It's definitely uh, we would be doing well. <laughs> yeah, you know, Dan, this this is a really tough situation, and I think this is the opposite side of that coin, right? You know, one thing I think I'd like to say from the start is you're not alone in feeling this way. I guarantee you. <laughs> I guarantee. Yes. Uh, well, one way, one reason I can say that with certainty is I felt very similar to you. Um, during my training at where I felt like, you know what, I, I came into this, you know, doing well at research, doing well in school, like liking research, all that stuff. But then at some point realizing, you know, there are other things about science that I like a lot more than some of the things that academia might have in store for me. Um, but, but, but what I've learned though, Dan, and we talked a lot about on this show, is that that's becoming more of an antiquated way of thinking as we approach <clears throat> PhD training. There's really lots and lots of things you can do with a PhD. Now, this has actually always been true, but I think what is newer is that that faculty and other leaders in your PhD program are starting to become aware of that fact for the students who are in the program now. But what can happen, though, is as a student in a PhD program, if you're not being exposed to these other options available to you, you can still have the mindset that, well, the only thing I can do with this degree or the only thing that I'm moving towards is being a researcher in academia, basically becoming my advisor someday. And so if that's the, if those are the only messages you're hearing and you don't feel like that's something you want to do, that can be really disheartening and you can feel like you're wasting your time, you know, continuing on that path. Been there, done that. <laughs> exactly. And it was stressful, right, Dan? Oh, it was awful. I think, you know, you certainly were in that place. And as a graduate student, you were pretty confident. Like, I don't want any part of being my PI. I don't want any part of being in this university setting doing research anymore. And I couldn't, I was the same as B. I, I could not imagine what else there was for me. It was, it was a really hard time. Yeah. But but I'm here to tell you that there are lots of things you can do with a PhD. There's lots of resources to to figure that out. And, and you know, this almost is is an interesting email to contrast with the advice that we gave Ben in the last email. 
like Ben was describing certain types of careers and certain things he liked to do that my concern might be really not the type of jobs that he might use a biomedical PhD for. Right. But some of the things, B, that you're describing here, you absolutely can do with a PhD. And I think a PhD really could actually help you uh, transition into some of these jobs. Now, I'm assuming some other things. I'm assuming that you have a supportive advisor. Some of the thing, other things that B said in the email le- led me to believe that that might be true. Um, you know, sometimes graduate students get in a situation where it really looks like there's too many roadblocks and there's just not a path to actually getting through graduate school. And so um, I understand that's a different scenario. But assuming that the main issue that B is facing here is internal and thinking like, you know what, I don't want to do academic research. I don't want to be a PI. So I guess I should leave graduate school. You know, you mentioned being really interested in science communication in talking about your science and uh, with others. And there's a lot of jobs out there you can do with a PhD that do that. I mean, there are science communication jobs. Uh, Dan, we've talked to some people on this show. Uh, back in episode 117, we we talked to someone who's working at a, as a medical science liaison. And the thing I remember about that interview was um, how this individual kind of what skills that she had that helped her be successful in this career. And that was in grad school, she loved giving talks. She loved talking about her science and communicating her science. And now she has this really great job where that's what she does all the time is just talk about her science. She's not in the lab. She's not doing research. And, you know, I would almost say that that most jobs you might get uh, with a PhD, if, if we were to poll all the people we knew who got a PhD, very few of them are actually in academia doing research anymore. Some are for sure. And that's definitely something you could do, but there's lots of other things you can do. And so based on the experiences you've had, the skills that you have and the things you say you enjoy, um, I think what you might do, um, you know, I don't know how far along this path of, of deciding to, to leave with your masters you're, you're on, but I might encourage you to just spend some time really engaging in some reflection or engaging in some information gathering on what careers are out there um, after a PhD. Because I think it might surprise you that there could be some things that are a great fit you could use your PhD for later. Yeah, that was the core ask, right, of this email is what other careers are out there for me? And so my, you know, assuming B has not already stepped out of the program, my advice would be to take this time while you're still enrolled Same as I I gave to Ben, take the time while you're still enrolled to do some informational interviews, uh, to do some additional research about careers. Because, Josh, you're exactly right. That medical science liaison job could be a perfect fit for B, but you need a PhD for it. So imagine you were in your fourth year, you were close to finishing, you could step into that career immediately afterward. But if you left, it might be more difficult to get back there. And so I would say as a fourth year, I wouldn't throw that away lightly unless I was very clear on what my career was going to be afterwards. Um, if I knew that my career was going to be, I want to be a line, you know, I want to be a, a chef at a restaurant. I'd be like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's your passion. You don't need a PhD for that. Get out. But if the career you want actually would benefit from that credential, then you know, there's this this notion of of just pushing through that last year or whatever it is to get the degree. And and while you're getting that final year done, lining up the job. And so you have something to look forward to that, that motivates you to get out. Yeah, Dan, I agree with all of that. And, you know, the last thing I wanted to say was if you have already, or if you're past the point of no return right. with making this decision to, to master out, that's totally fine too. And Sometimes that is the right decision. And we've actually talked to people on this show um, who have made that decision, who decided to leave the PhD program with a master's degree. I know multiple other people who have done that that we haven't talked to on the show. And the one commonality is they are all doing well. They all have careers that they are really excited about, too. So even if that's the decision you've already made and that's right for you, um, even for other reasons that you didn't articulate in your email I think the advice that we have given uh, still holds. I think it's still, there's a lot of careers out there for you that I think you would find really satisfying. Um, So spending some time engaging that, um, regardless of of where you are in deciding to leave, um, 
is worth your time. Yeah, it doesn't matter what credential you have. Knowing <laughs> your motivated abilities, the types of jobs that you'll be happy in is valuable, whether you have a master's degree or no degree or whatever it is. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, depend on what kind of uh, degree you hold. All right, Dan, these were, some, these were some great discussions, and I hope this was helpful to, um, to B and to Ben and maybe to anyone else out there who, who's listening, who's maybe, and actually, I know this is true, <laughs> there are people who are out there listening who are in the middle of their training, in the middle of their graduate program, and they're second-guessing, they're thinking like, ah, is this really what I want to do? Is this really leading somewhere? I'd be surprised if everybody <laughs> wasn't thinking that. I'd be surprised if there were people like, yep, this is totally for me. I love it. Uh, and you know, Dan, I, I just wanted, before we wrapped up, to say the thing that I feel like I say all the time, but I think it's important to remember, is again, no matter where you are in a PhD program in graduate school, no matter how you feel about it, realizing that graduate school is not a, full, is not a full-time permanent position it's not a permanent position. It's a temporary stepping stone to something else you want to do. And what's key is just making sure and checking in and self-assessing that the thing you think you want to do eventually, graduate school is the right stepping stone to get there. That's right. And and take the time, use it. I think one of my regrets was not uh, using my time in graduate school to think about my career. Uh, I, I finally got around to it, but but start early go do those informational interviews, commit to yourself. I'm going to interview five people with different careers and ask them to introduce me to somebody. And through that networking, you're going to learn a lot about industry and and what jobs are available for PhDs or for people with masters or whatever it is. People that are doing neuroscience research or helping people with disabilities, you're going to learn all of that because you're going to follow the threads through your contacts. And so I th- take the time. Graduate school, is <laughs> it is temporary but it also affords you the opportunity to be flexible with your time. All right, Dan. Well, these great conversations today came about because listeners um, wrote in and told us about what they're thinking, what they're going through. If you have a question that's in your mind or a topic idea you want for us to discuss on the show, we'd love to hear it. And you can do that by emailing us at podcast at hellophd.com. Send us a tweet at hellophd. And if you like the show, you can even leave a review on Apple Podcasts. We love your feedback. If you'd like to support the show, you can become a patron. Simply go to our website, hellophd.com, click the Become a Patron button, or visit patreon.com slash hellophd, and we would appreciate the beer or fruit-flavored whiskey money. But thanks so much. <laughs> I <laughs> think this is the so. only one we're going to do. So. Uh, but regardless, thanks to the ongoing support from all of our patrons. All right, Josh. Well, be safe up there. Uh, we will see you again when you tour North Carolina in the near future. And uh, we'll talk to you next time. Talk to you next time, Dan.